Good to see all of you have braved the snow. I uh, was sincere that I want to leave it up to you. Please be as cautious and careful. So those of you that stayed home, um, I hope that we're all safe driving home. But great to have a good group. We're celebrating communion today. I am kind of wondering, does it, in Delaware, does it only snow on Sundays so that pastors have to make the tough calls? I mean, it always starts. Uh, I've got two weeks in a row here. It's all right. Um, doesn't seem to be like it's going to accumulate too much. Let's turn to our scripture passage this morning. We are in Luke chapter 4, about halfway through. Let's go to verse 14. Last week, we saw Jesus tempted in the wilderness. We're going to go from verses 14 through 30. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about Him went out through all the surrounding country. And He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And He came to Nazareth, where He had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed." to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Let's pray. Almighty, eternal, merciful God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths. Open and illuminate our hearts and minds to better understand your word and to conform our lives to what we've understood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Several years ago, I returned to Fort Lauderdale, where I had, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I had spent a few, uh, some time there after college. My parents lived there. I went back to visit my little brother who was living there. My, my twin brother came, his brother reunion. And our little brother took us to a church that had started in the time since I had been gone. And uh, it was a church plant that was reaching out to the city, preaching the gospel. The, the pastor did a great job, and you know, I was really impressed by the worship and the people. But I just couldn't get over one thing. The pastor's name was Brad, and he had been part of the high school youth group when I was in college at, at my dad's church. And he was a shy, kind of maybe freshman, sophomore when I was there. And so here I am 20 years later, and I just 
can't get over the fact that Brad, who in my mind is still a quiet freshman in high school, is this excellent preacher and great church, effective church planter. I just remember remarking to my brother, how is he doing this? He's only 15. But of course, he was in his mid-30s and had really come a long way. I, I, I kind of feel the same way when I see some of my friends from college. I don't know if you have this phenomenon. I, I went back to Waco. I went to Baylor. And my best friend there, Doug, now owns a marketing company and employs like 20 people. has a big staff. He's making, calling all the shots. He's got all these big accounts in Central Texas. And I shouldn't be surprised. He's a really intelligent, mature guy with great leadership skills. But I just can't help like thinking back to college and when we were you know, yelling at the refs and talking about girls and drinking Dr. Pepper and Belch, you know, just college stuff. And so it's hard for me to see people. Of course, I'm on the receiving end of this when I talk to people that knew me as a kid, my parents, friends. I knew you were this big and now you have... Four kids and two in college? How can that be? Well, that's the dynamic that Jesus encountered when he returned to his hometown. His hometown, of course, Nazareth, not Bethlehem, where he was born, right? That was just the temporary go check in for the census. But Nazareth, where he grew up. The people in his hometown knew him as a child and as a young man and a carpenter, you know, working with his father. They knew his family, his parents, all his siblings. And they know, or they thought they knew, there's there's nothing special about this family. There's no mystical, spiritual anointing, right? They're just an average, maybe less than average. We'll talk about that. Uh, Jewish family in this small town. How could Jesus be preaching and teaching and doing miraculous spiritual things? You probably know that saying, there, you can't really go home again. And what, what they usually mean is that things change. And you, you, you have these memories that are not going to line up with what it was like. Right? Your family, your home, your town may, may disappoint you because it's not the same. Well, Jesus went home. Not a lot had changed, but He had changed. And He had a difficult time. They couldn't accept who he was, and what, he had be, what had become of his life. So as we look at the text, maybe we'll see that some of the same issues that we have, that we see in the Nazarenes, the not really understanding Jesus and the nature of his ministry. So the first eight verses, let's read those again. They're about where Jesus went to worship and did what he did everywhere. Uh, So let's read those again. The first point is the fulfillment of the Scriptures. Verses 14 through 21. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about Him went out through all the surrounding country. And He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And He came to Nazareth where He had been brought up. And as was His custom, He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, let's have our first practical application of the sermon right up front. You know, usually I wait till we work through the text a little to understand it and apply it, usually near the end. But let's get it up front. Because verse 16 says, As was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. 
If Jesus' custom was to go to worship every Sabbath day, which would have been Saturday for them, right? Would anyone argue that his followers are not expected to do the same? The Sabbath, now the Lord's day on Sunday because of the resurrection. But if Jesus did it, he calls us to meet together, <laughs> preaching to the choir in a sense here, those that have come out. Now, I'm not talking about people who are physically unable and bad weather, all those things, and when things are uncertain during this COVID era, right? I'm not hammering that. But we live in a time when the definition of a faithful churchgoer has changed, right? It used to be that a faithful churchgoer went every week unless you were sick or out of town or providentially hindered somehow. But nowadays, you can call yourself a faithful churchgoer if you let go less than two times a month. Um, Tom Rainier is a man who monitors church trends in this country, said that uh, he did a survey, and people consider themselves regular attenders if they went three out of every eight weeks. Less than half, regular. That's not enough. Again, this is a weird time and, and we have people quarantining, not comfortable enough. I, we understand that. <laughs> but I think normally when things open up, we're going to challenge people to follow Jesus' example. Go old school with your <laughs> regular attendance, what that used to mean. Right? When you're physically able, come. We need you here, engaged, growing in the Lord. Right? We need to use your gifts for the body and beyond. We need you here in service. When, I mean, when we think about like, who's not going to be here, I mean, we have to go through a long list of people who are participating and doing behind the scenes work. We need that. It's fantastic to have. We all need the fellowship and the encouragement of the saints to grow in our faith. Right? We come. We grow, and then we go. But you have to come. It's part of it. Now, back to the text. Apparently, it was customary to have a reading from the prophets near the end of a Jewish synagogue service in those days. It was called the Haftarah. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And any young man in the community could do the reading and say a few words about the passage. And apparently Jesus took that opportunity at any, any time he could in every synagogue he went to, right? Because so, verse 15 says he taught in all their synagogues. I don't think he was a guest lecturer necessarily, uh, but he would participate in that part of the service. And he was well received up to this point, right? His, his, people were talking about him, the wisdom, and, and we'll get into some of the things they said, but... I love how dramatic verse 20 is, right? Jesus goes up, they hand him the scroll, he unrolls it, but after he read it, he handed it back to the attendant and then sat down. Every eye fixed on him to say something. I feel like I should try that sometime. Just sit and wait for you to stare at me and I really have your attention. And I'm sure some of you would love for me just to preach a one-sentence sermon like Jesus did. Maybe it was longer, but that's what we got. But as, as we look at what Jesus read from, I think it's interesting that just as a passage from Isaiah, Isaiah 40, verse 3, had, had kind of given the thesis statement or the def definition that defined John the Baptist's ministry so well, right? A voice crying in the wilderness. Now we have this passage, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, that defined Jesus' ministry so well. Now, keep in mind, there were no verse and chapter breakdowns back then, right? That came in the 1300s. Um, so we've only had, maybe the 13th century, uh, we've only had that for like 700 years. No, you had a long scroll and the fact that Jesus knew exactly where to go, man, He knew the Scriptures so well that He could find it quickly. Another point of application if you want it. Know your Bible. 
well enough to know where to go. Read it. But so he selected this scripture to declare to his hometown, friends, family, neighbors, that he was the fulfillment of it. He was claiming to be God's anointed one, right? The Messiah. Since the text said that the Spirit had anointed him for ministry. Really, Jesus could have used any text and said, this has been fulfilled in me. But this one was just more obvious and and direct about the nature of his ministry. Now, in verse 18... He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Who are the people that will be receiving the Lord's favor through Jesus? Right? The people who didn't really expect it. When you're so used to thinking about God just blessing the prosperous and the privileged, It's hard sometimes to hear Jesus' message that He's coming for the poor, the oppressed, the captives, the blind. They would be receiving the great gifts and blessings from Jesus. They would be the focus of His ministry. Now, some clarifying questions here. Is it the literal poor or the spiritual poor who will be ministered to? Is it the physically blind or the spiritually blind who will be made to see? Is it the people being physically oppressed or spiritually oppressed receiving liberty? And the answer is yes. Right? It's both and. Jesus saves us in all of our need. We don't make the error of saying that the Bible's message is all about helping our fellow human beings, and that works of social action are the only thing that matter. But we also don't go the other stream of saying that we need to just focus on spiritual change and ignore people's physical and material needs, right? Now, I believe the Bible says our greatest need, our greater need is to be made right with God spiritually, in right relationship with Him. But that doesn't mean we ignore people's physical needs, right? James 2, verses 15 through 17 says, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Right, James says our faith comes alive when we help those in need. And Jesus would model that balance by ministering to both the physical and the spiritual. Right? As He healed the blind, the lepers, cast out demons out of the oppressed, fed the hungry, but also clearly taught the ways of the kingdom, the ways of God. Now, at the end of what Jesus quotes is a reference to the year of Jubilee in verse 19. It says, the year of the Lord's favor. You know what that is? Do you remember in Leviticus chapter 25? Every 50th year. Why 50th? Well, there were seven sevens. Seven, the Sabbath kind of, it's a long discussion. But you got 49 years, and then on the 50th year, slaves or indentured servants were set free. Right? Debtors were released from what they owed. And any land that had uh, been brokered away or, or taken away from its real owner was returned, was restored. So, is Jesus saying, hey, it's been 49 years, I'm here to announce that next year everyone goes free and everybody gets their land back? No, I think what Jesus is saying is, I am the year of Jubilee. I am what the Jubilee represents, what it points towards. My work is restoration and freedom from oppression. Right? Jesus' ministry, spreading the good news, proclaiming liberty was the very essence of 
Jubilee. All right. So how did the congregation receive Jesus' one-sentence sermon? Initially, well, right? But then they doubted. Let's look at the next section from verses 22 through 27. The rejection of the hometown prophet. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months. And a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. All right, initially it seemed like Jesus' sermon message was well received. The people had gracious words. But Jesus sensed that they were doubting who he was. The Gospel of Mark records a little more detail where Luke just says they were saying, isn't this Joseph's son? Uh, Mark 6 says that they were asking, where did this man get these things? How are such mighty works done by his hands? So this is a, a greater kind of questioning and doubting. Right? They had known him and his family their whole lives. They considered them just regular people in this small village of probably under 500 people. They're, in their mind, carpenters, right? lowly manual laborers don't become these incredible spiritual gurus. As far as they knew, Jesus didn't have this formal rabbi training. Additionally, remember what Nathaniel, who becomes one of the disciples, said in the Gospel of John, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's how everybody else looked at Nazareth, and maybe they looked at themselves that way, right? Maybe they, they viewed it like that. One other thing is they, they might have still been remembering the circumstances of Jesus' birth. Have you thought about that? They, they still believe that Jesus was illegitimate, having been conceived out of wedlock. So maybe this was a way to mock him. We know that guy from that family. Why, we remember the scandal that they tried to pass off as a virgin birth. Right? There's no way God is working through him now. This prophet truly was not accepted in his hometown. And he felt that. They thought they knew him. But they rejected it, who he had become. Now verse 23 says that Jesus realize what they were thinking about him. Both their doubts and their desire for him to perform some kind of miracle in the same way he did in Capernaum. Now, Luke hasn't really talked about that, um, what Jesus did in Capernaum, but Matthew did. In Matthew 4.23, in addition to teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, it says that Jesus healed every disease, every affliction among the people. They brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. For whatever reason, Luke hasn't really gone into that yet. But part of Jesus' fame spreading is that he's starting to do amazing things. And so the hometown crowd says, okay, we'll do one here. But Jesus would not produce a miracle on demand. Right? Instead, he cited two Old Testament stories of how the prophets, Elijah and Elisha, could have done miracles and wonders in their homeland, but chose instead to do them in foreign lands. We studied the first passage about when Elijah had fled uh, after declaring the drought, and the Lord took him to the house of a widow and her son. It was outside of Israel. Right in the land of Sidon, and, and he stayed with them and helped 
keep them alive. Their food multiplied miraculously. That was outside of Israel. And then Elisha could have healed lepers inside of Israel, but Naaman the Syrian was sent to him, and he healed him. Now these examples, I think, are Jesus saying, A, you don't deserve my miracles because you don't believe me. And B, don't be surprised when my ministry extends outside of Israel. If you reject me, I'm going to take it to where people will believe. This is a reminder to us. If your faith is dependent on God intervening or doing something miraculous right when you need Him to, you're going to be sorely disappointed, right? God will act when He chooses. He asks us to come to Him in prayer. And He will answer our prayers, but maybe not exactly how we want it. And so if we need Him to heal somebody in our family immediately, or get us out of this bad situation, or get me the job that I need, or the spouse, or kids, or whatever we demand, and if He doesn't jump right in and get it done, then I don't really believe in Him. But that's not faith, right? That's presumption. That's a lot like last week's Do not put the Lord your God to the test. If you really think God owes you an explanation or action on your timetable, I would direct you to the last five chapters of Job. That might give you the answers, not the ones you're looking for. Now, to wrap up the text, the last three verses... I've never been physically attacked for something that I said in a sermon. But then again, I've never claimed to be God's anointed one. The next three verses show the wrath of the people, verses 28 through 30. When they heard these things, all all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. In the history of overreactions, this seems to rank pretty high. (laughs) It seems like a big overreaction to me. Jesus' friends and neighbors grabbed him and marched him out to a cliff to throw him off. What were they angry about? Was it still that, I fulfill the Scripture line? Was it the fact that he's put himself on par with the prophets Elijah and Elisha? That he has insulted them? Refused to work miracles for them? Or said that he would bless the Gentiles? Maybe it's all of those things. And their anger was building Deuteronomy chapter 13 had instructions for when to put a false prophet to death. So maybe they thought this is what God wanted them to do. Maybe they thought this had a biblical warrant, justification. But verse 30 says that he passed through them and went away. I don't know exactly what that looked like. But they didn't dare touch Jesus when he wouldn't allow it. So... Jesus left and he never came back to his hometown that any of the Gospels record. It's a reminder that some rejections are final. Yes, sometimes God is the hound of heaven. That's that's what a famous poem called him where he uh, pursues people through the years despite their rejections and their fleeing from him. He's the hound of heaven pursuing them. But at other times... God relents. God gives them over to their unbelief, as Romans 1 says. He leaves people alone when they've rejected Him. So, the people wanted to kill Jesus. This is not the first time Jesus has been spared death, right? We remember how Herod tried to kill Him as an infant. It's certainly not going to be the last time. And as we think about 
the end of his life. This is a similar reason here that Jesus was arrested. Well, he was betrayed, arrested, tried, or sentenced to death because he claimed to be God and because he was doing ministry to the wrong people. The mob violence that would not work here in chapter 4 would work at the end of his life, right? As Jesus' fellow countrymen yelled for the Roman authorities to crucify him. Now, Jesus clearly had the ability to stop any violence against him. We've seen that in this passage. So, submitting to that violence at the end of his life was an act of Jesus' will. He allowed himself to be led to slaughter. He allowed himself to be unjustly sentenced and placed on a cross. Why? Because he loved us so much that he would submit to death in our place. John 10, verses 17 and 18. Jesus said, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Jesus willingly gave up his life on the cross so that our sins would be placed on him, and so that his death would pay the penalty that we deserve. He gave his life as a ransom for us, fulfilling the Father's plan and purpose. Now, as we think about some ways to apply this passage. I know that I've been to some churches. Um, There are churches that want to be kind of super relevant and and focus on helping you live up to your full potential. Uh, I think this would be the point in that sermon where they would say something along the lines of this. Be like Jesus and don't let anyone keep you down. Right? Your past doesn't have to define you. Don't let people's low expectations or limitations keep you from achieving your dreams. They knew you then, but they don't know you now and how you've grown and will achieve great things. You tell them who you are and you keep fighting for your God-given mission. People will always tell you that you can't do it, but God says that you can. Have you, have you heard some sermons that have uh, kind of a theme of this? Um, It's all fine and good. There's some truth there. There's nothing necessarily heretical, but I want to suggest that that's hardly the point of the passage. And I think taking it in a direction like that really rips it from being a Jesus-centered passage to being all about what we get out of life, what I want out of life, with a little spiritual veneer to baptize it. I think this goes a lot deeper than that. And the question is really, where do you see yourself? Because if you see yourself as Jesus there, maybe you're missing the fact that you, that we are naturally the neighbors, the townspeople in our unbelief. And maybe we are the spiritually poor and blind. But also, this is a great reminder that Jesus' divinity was veiled, right? Let's not lose sight of that. He was on earth. People didn't recognize anything special about him, right? He didn't walk around with a halo. You couldn't tell he was from God. Isaiah 53, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. So people who saw Jesus in the flesh didn't have any idea that he was God, It's only when he taught deep spiritual truths or did something like healing a leper, leper, calming the storm, and the Spirit opened people's eyes that they were able to see this man is from God or this man is the Son of God. He even says to Peter, blessed are you, the Spirit has revealed who I am to you. But a lot of people like those people who knew him when he was young, couldn't understand or agree with that. Even when they saw it with their own eyes, their unbelief, their spiritual prejudices blinded them. 
Sometimes Jesus is just too familiar. We already feel like we know who He is. Do you know the actress Letitia Wright? You'd probably know her from the Black Panther movie, uh, Avengers. She plays the Black Panther's scientist sister. Well, she, she was giving an interview recently and said that five years ago she knew that she wasn't living a fulfilled life. But she didn't know what was missing. And she said this, I didn't know that missing piece was Jesus. I didn't want anything to do with Jesus, actually. Especially as a young black person, you think, oh man, it's a white guy. I don't want to worship that. But after seeing a few friends turn their lives around after becoming Christians, she started giving Jesus a second thought. She said that observing her friend's faith helped her realize that's what my life was meant to look like. She made a deal with herself. I'll try Jesus for a year. And it had been at least a year. See what happens. She said, I'm still here and I'm not going back. So you can pray for her. But she realized that he wasn't white, that he was a Middle Eastern looking person and said, either way, it's bigger than what his hair looked like or his skin looked like. It was about his heart. It's about what he did for us here on earth and how real He is, and how real the Spirit of God is. So the challenge is that if you don't know truly who Jesus is, either you're not a believer in Jesus, or maybe you've been coming to church, but you don't really know if you buy all this, haven't really figured it out, I want to encourage you, keep asking questions. Get your questions answered. We may, you may be like the citizens of Nazareth in the sense that you're willing to grant that he was a historical person who lived in Israel for over 30 years and created a stir with his teachings and activities and was ultimately put to death by Rome, but you cannot go any further than that. You can't believe that Jesus was also fully God. That God took on human form, particularly in such an obscure time and manner. But I would say that if that's all you're willing to grant to Jesus, then you might as well agree with his family. Do you remember what his family said about him in Mark 3, 21? When they were first kind of confronted with his teachings, they said he's out of his mind. Kind of what the rest of the hometown felt. Jesus was constantly claiming to be God. And if he wasn't, then he was out of his mind. Or he was just a liar and a fraud. Either you take the whole accounts of the Gospel of Jesus being the God-man who had spiritual authority over all things, or you reject the whole thing. There's no middle ground. But when you realize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life anointed by God to accomplish the great work of redemption for all history, for all of humanity, then Jesus can work in your life. You can realize your great spiritual poverty, that you have been dead in your sins and are hopeless and doomed to destruction for your sins and your rejection of Him. But Jesus speaks life and good news to you in your poverty. And you can realize your spiritual blindness, that you do not understand God's ways until He reveals them to you. And when you believe in Jesus, you are, until you believe in Jesus, you're blind to what He can accomplish in your life. And you can realize that you were in bondage and oppression to your sin and the works of the evil one, but that Jesus set you free. You can look at the cross and see Jesus' body sacrificed on your behalf and His blood shed for you. And so now, this morning, we move to the table, Jesus' table, what we call the Lord's Supper, where we come and are reminded physically, tangibly, what He did for us. That His body was broken on the cross. His blood shed for us. He gave 
Himself, as I said, willingly He chose to lay down His life for each one of us on our behalf. The Scriptures say that that death was to take our sin on His account and to give us His righteousness. That is what all the Scriptures point to. When I say that the Scriptures were fulfilled by Jesus, everything in the Old Testament pointed forward to Jesus and His life and work, death and resurrection and everything after pointed back. The climax of human history happened on the cross. And we celebrate that this morning. We're going to declare together the Apostles' Creed before we uh, confess our sins and then partake of the elements, but let's remind one another and ourselves what we believe. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He shall come to judge quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So being reminded of the great truths of the faith, we invite anyone who believes that, who has embraced that, who considers themselves a Christ follower to join us in this sacrament. We would say that if you have not come to that place in your life that you would refrain from partaking of the cup and the bread. And that you consider the claims of Christ much deeper. Reach out to us. I would love to talk to you about it. Anyone who is a believer here would love to talk to you about that question that is so vital. We also uh, encourage Children who have not yet joined the church on their own met with the session to refrain from partaking. Not because they don't believe, but we believe that there's uh, reflection, uh, that we need to know what, that they understand the truth. But that day will come. Before I consecrate the elements, is before we get into that, we want to take the time because 1 Corinthians says that we are to examine ourselves. So let's take some time to think about our sins, to repent privately and quietly of them. Isaiah 55, 7 reminds us, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Christ's forgiveness is free.